It is about that time, so if you'll be opening your Bibles to Ecclesiastes and your notebooks to the intro, we're going to be doing some review of Solomon tonight in his life and then spend a little bit of time looking at Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon in very short form. Great to have everybody here. We know we have some folks visiting. We have some other folks who are out there on live stream. I uh, want you to know it's a great grace to study the Word of God with you. Uh, we are going to be looking, as I mentioned, at uh, the sort of second half of that study on Solomon's life, and they'll be finishing uh, the, lar the kind of direct teaching of the first two weeks. Hopefully you've been able to read those first nine chapters and, and spend a little time looking at them or listening to them. First nine chapters of uh, Proverbs on my phone is only 24 minutes, and so that's, uh, that's a lot less time than one imagines it might be. Um, but of course, when I read, I read much slower than that, so it takes me a little bit longer than that. And when you play with it in your mind, like you're supposed to do with Proverbs, it also takes a bit more time. There are several things we do need to keep in our prayers. Now, we've had several different people going through various kinds of operations and suffering with different kinds of illnesses, and we need to continue to pray for them. Of course, our prayers are always with the brothers and sisters in other countries who are suffering affliction, and most especially the folks in the Ukraine uh, whom we know, uh, and uh, all the other uh, Christians in so many different countries are going through different kinds of affliction. And we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, reminded that even when you do things right, it's a very broken world. And so we pray and God helps. And by his grace, people can still have some grace and peace and joy in the midst of incredible affliction. Uh, and it's very humbling to see uh, brothers and sisters get on with that. At this time, though, let's begin with an opening prayer. Ask Brother Bronco to lead us in an uh, opening prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us that uh, we could come here and learn a portion from your word father and we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have and we pray that you'll be with those that can't be here with us we know we have many in our number that are sick or in suffering and we just pray that you'll be with them and hopefully they can join us through the live stream and and still learn from your word father we just pray that you'll guide us as we as we learn from your word and help us to to soak it in and to to be able to apply it to our lives today. I know this your word has been around for a long time, and we just pray that uh, that we'll be able to take what we need from it, so that we can apply, so that we can use it in our lives here today. Father, we just are thankful for Ed and the opportunity that he has to to study your word and to to bring it to life for us. We thank you again for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. The things that he said there are so very true. And one of the great graces of my life has been able be, being able to have the time and opportunity to study the word of God. Uh, and now, even in my retirement, uh, to have the opportunity to do that. And even though uh, I kind of stumble and bumble about, uh, you know, that's kind of what old people do. Uh, it's still a great grace to be able to uh, stay in the word and to continue to learn and grow. That's one of the great graces we have. So we're going to be second, finishing up the second half of the introduction to Solomon tonight. And let's see if this is going to, yes, it did turn on. Uh, and, uh, and then we're going to be looking Sunday morning at that first nine chapters. Uh, as you can see, there are three sections. Each has an introductory poem and then several different uh, invitations from different characters in there. Uh, in that, there's a slow introduction to some of the actual proverb proverbs but most of it has to do with incentives. And that's important because all of us need to uh, be incentivized at the beginning of a particular study. And since Proverbs, of the book, is designed to be a beginning of a study and actually a study in itself, it's good to have some, uh, some, uh, some different kinds of motivation to study. Uh, we're also going to enjoy the presence of the Milton High Schoolers on Sunday because it's the beginning of the summer children's classes and so they'll be with us on Sunday morning and then next Wednesday night, we'll have a singing instead of the class that we normally have. Uh, and so that Sunday morning will, will be the, uh, the only real opportunity we have to talk about those nine chapters. So be sure you write down the things you want to get said on that. We saw that God has given us instruction in the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The word Torah really means instruction and not law codes. So all of it is instruction, the narrative as well as the law codes. Um, but those were particularly given to God's people for a purpose, so that they could live well and live wisely. And the principles of there are useful for any human being to live well and wisely, 
so that in writing people could translate that into other nations' uh, languages and did, and so other people could read that in addition to God's people. Then we find that in the rest of that uh, wonderful scripture that we have, there are different sections that illustrate that both by history and by poetry and art. The, what we're looking at in this class has to do with Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Job uh, that are all artistic ways of illustrating that, uh, as is the Psalms. Uh, and then Jesus came into the world and lived that law perfectly and taught it in the most mature and complete manner possible and then gave it to us uh, in a great form as a new covenant by dying on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven and so that we could die with him in baptism and begin a new life as we are able to work with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to permit this way of life to become our way of life and to show God's wisdom uh, to this broken world. Uh, certainly imperfectly, because we're not going to do it flawlessly, but when we do it penitently, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are able to uh, work through uh, all of the different things going on in life, uh, and lots of people then can come to see the truth of the gospel and be saved. Not only that, we saw that those same teachings were taught in Ephesians, Colossians, and the other uh, letters, 1 Peter, Titus, uh, the letters written by Jesus' apostles and sometimes by the prophets. My understanding is we'll probably be looking at Titus uh, in the fall, and Titus and 1 Timothy take these same principles and not only teach them to us once again, but they also use them to evaluate leadership in, in both male and female leadership in 1 Timothy in chapter 3 for the elders and the deacons in chapter 5 for the specially supported uh, widows indeed. So these are very important principles for Christians to have. They are part of being saved, uh, and they are a great illustration. Uh, I'm having some issues with my computer being slow. There it is. Uh, and so the illustration I have of that is that the law is like a tree trunk, and then you have these different branches that illustrate it, the former prophets that we call history, and the poetry that we're looking at, especially in this class, the uh, larger and smaller uh, prophets that are written prophets, major and minor prophets. But Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. He is the fruit of the tree. He is the blossom. Uh, he is the perfection of it. We are members of his body. Everything happens in a text that uh, is surrounded by uh, different contexts, not only the literature that's around it, but the historical circumstance that's around it. And that's why we're spending time looking at Solomon, because this uh, these three books are associated with him. Job is, of course, different. Uh, it's important to understand what kind of context this would come in, and so hopefully the different readings that we've had have been helpful. But as we've noticed, especially last Wednesday night, wisdom is a way of living one moment at a time. Uh, it's not a commodity that we keep in our hip pocket. It's not a, a, a book or set of books that we keep in the library. It's important for us to actually develop these habits uh, so that we have trained ourselves to behave in ways that succeed and that work, and that God has taught us in Scripture is the target we're supposed to hit. And so let's take, again, a look at Solomon. We spent some time noticing that his life was a life of unrealized potential, uh, that he inherited from God's grace and his father a, a, a nation that was united and blessed with wealth and peace. Uh, and he was already given the plans and materials for the Lord's temple provided by his father David so that he was able to build that temple in seven years. Uh, he did build a personal palace for himself that we'll mention again in a minute. Uh, but his glory largely was a worldly glory. And so he lived an unrealized life. And so him talking about the limitations of wisdom uh, is very real and very important. We saw that he permitted idol worship and supported it among his wives. We saw that the Lord then tore this united kingdom from him and gave it to his son Rehoboam. Uh, Rehoboam, by the way, was not only the son of, of Solomon, but his mother was from one of the adjacent countries. She was an Ammonite. She was not even an Israelite. And that's very interesting since we saw that uh, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, but the one that he selected as an heir did not come from an Israelite. In fact, there's no mention in any of Scripture of him ever marrying an Israelite, which is a very interesting and embarrassing thing for my Jewish friends uh, who would, would say he loved shiksas more than he did women who were of his own people. And so because of his sinfulness, the Lord uh, promised that he would give this to uh, this uh, northern ten tribes to his uh, servant who had fled to Egypt and raised up some people all, all at the same time that Solomon was alive. 
Hadad of Eden and Netzen of Aram or Syria, uh, Edom in the south, Aram or Syria in the northeast, uh, both were raised up while he was still ruling. And so he began to have some pressure on his borders that he had not had earlier in his rule. And as we mentioned, Jeroboam was, uh, was told that he would rule over the ten tribes. And in a great passage, uh, God told uh, Jeremiah, the one who was going to rule the northern ten tribes, that not only would he rule those ten tribes, but that if he kept the law, the way Deuteronomy 17 said a king was supposed to keep the law. If he kept the law, he and his descendants would rule perpetually, Olam, forever, just like the southern kingdom. And so God gave them a chance to have a dynasty that would extend for as long as they were obedient. Uh, but of course, God, who knows the hearts of all men, knew that uh, that, that was not going to, to actually play out that way. Uh, and so you have uh, that kingdom... Uh, dissolving in the Assyrians, taking them into captivity. Uh, but therefore, my thought is that basically what he left us, besides the lineage of Jesus, Jesus' ancestry is pretty important, but the thing he left us that had lasting influence are these books that we're going to be studying. And so we saw him righteous, blessed, but cursed, and talked a little bit about how each of these were elements in his life. And I suggested to you that the more you study this in detail, the harder it is to accept the sometimes taught view that he was great early, and then he got worse, and then he got terrible. Because the very first thing that 1 Kings 3, 1 says is that he, fought, he, that he married the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, and that daughter of Pharaoh then becomes problematic. And then after he has this wonderful wisdom, he demonstrates it uh, by talking about the, how to deal with the two prostitutes and the one baby that was alive. That's all wonderful. And like we mentioned before, he was certainly admired by the Queen of Sheba, and that's wonderful. But the rest of chapter 4 is a matter of him doing a lot of things that look more like Pharaoh than they look like the king of Deuteronomy 17. And so as we saw, he was a problematic king. And so he violated those elements of the law that involved don't multiply uh, horses and chariots. Uh, he did that. He trusted in military might. Don't multiply women. Well, he didn't, didn't do, uh, obey that. He multiplied women. He trusted in celebrity sex appeal and powerful alliances. He multiplied silver and gold, so he trusted in financial force. He did not have his heart completely devoted to the Lord, although he started out loving the Lord. And so I gave you this little outline that talks about some of his events, and I do want to just highlight with you uh, several different things about that. Uh, first of all, that he did gain, gain this wonderful blessing of the kingdom because of the uh, decision of his, his father, David and, of course, God's promise in 2 Samuel 7, uh, when God said, I will raise up a son for you, Solomon was not born, but the other, the other sons of David had already been born. And so he literally raised up Solomon after that promise in 2 Samuel 7. And so David then uh, is, is, uh, decides whenever one of his, his uh, sons tries to, uh, to coronate himself or have himself coronated, that something needs to be done. Uh, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and the prophet Natan come to him and say, look, this is what's going on. And David said, well, let's just quash it now. So he immediately coronated Solomon with Natan, the, the prophet, uh, anointing him. And so you then have that. But you'll notice then the first things that he does are very worldly world, ruler sorts of things. Uh, he executes Adonijah. He ex executes Abiathar. Uh, he has his military commander, commander Benaiah, uh, execute Joab. Benaiah then becomes his new commander, and then he has them uh, execute Shemai after Shemai fails to uh, keep a, the one command that he was given. And so his, uh, his first whole chapter there uh, in, in chapter 2 is taken up not with him obeying the laws of God, but rather him doing the things that his father David uh, should have been doing as king and executing justice and uh, also, by the way, uh, cleaning up all of his enemies. We saw then that sacrifice at Gibeon, his dream, his prayer, God's answer to his prayer, read some of that. And then we see him making treaties with outsiders, drafting workers from Israel. Uh, who drafted workers in Exodus? Pharaoh. Pharaoh, right? Anything in the law about the king of Israel supposed to draft workers? No. But whenever Samuel says, listen, here's what's going to happen when you have a king in 1 Samuel 8, he says, he's going to do everything he wants to do with your people. He's going to take your, your kids to work for him. Well, that's what Solomon now starts to do. Saul had not done that. 
David had not done that. Now we have Solomon doing that. Uh, he does promise that if he walks according to his, God promises that if Solomon walks according to his law, that the prophecies of 2 Samuel 7 will take place. Uh, he goes ahead and builds the temple, and then he builds his palace. It takes 13 years to build his house after seven years of building the temple. Uh, he has this craftsman, craftsman Hiram. Now, the Hiram is both the name of the king of Tyre, but also of the craftsman. So you can get those confused. But this particular craftsman actually was part Israelite. It says that his mother uh, was a Naphtali from Naphtali in the north, uh, but his father, of course, was Tyrian, and he lived in Tyre. And so he gets involved in that. He'll also do the brass work. That's why I highlighted those. And so he is working within the law in some respects uh, and doing what God wants him to. And then God comes. His glory is uh, present in the temple as it was in the tabernacle uh, and uh, as it was on Sinai, this overwhelming, majestic presence of the Lord that's called the glory of the Lord so bright that it bounced off Moses' face and he had to veil himself. That glory shows up in the temple and people can't even stay in the temple because it's so magnificent and so glorious. Um, and that then uh, confirms that God approves that temple. Uh, that's important because there are several books that have been written in recent years saying that the temple was contrary to God's will. Uh, that's not true. God uh, confirmed it by being present there in Ezekiel. He said that glory was leaving that temple and moving east. But there's a lot of negativity, and as I mentioned, 2 Chronicles 8 and 11 makes this point that Solomon had to move Pharaoh's daughter out of the newly built palace complex with the uh, temple because he said that it was too holy for her. This is the first woman he marries is a woman that's, that's not holy enough to be connected to the plan of David, and yet that's the one that he picked. And so like I said, there's lots of different problematic aspects of it. Uh, his revenue and wealth were world famous. His military buildup was noted and world famous. Uh, he had a, uh, a disastrous uh, spiritual heritage then of following these women and uh, allowing them then to have different idolatrous gods. And in point of fact, there are verses that say he himself was involved in them. And that's a kind of a funny thing to us. We think of that you had to abandon the Lord. But if you kept the Lord but also added other gods then you were being unfaithful to the Lord. Even if you did not completely abandon the Lord, you had abandoned the Lord in, in, in not permitting him to be the only God, the only Lord. Uh, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There's just one. And so they had a, he had a problem with that. Um, and so whenever idolatry continues to be a problem, it didn't start after Solomon. It started with Solomon. Uh, and then again, God strengthened the Syrian and the, and the Edomite, and Jeroboam was ordained, and so forth. So now let's take a little bit of a look at the other things that we're going to talk about later in the class. We're going to open up with Proverbs. But after we've gone to school on Proverbs, and we've got all of them memorized, and we've got to where we can turn them over in our minds and work with them, and all the things that we're probably not going to get done in the short amount of time we're going to be working on it uh, in this class, but that I know many of you have studied these Proverbs for many, many years. And some of you have gotten the drift of how these Proverbs work, how the art of them works, how they pull your mind into things, and how they make you have to think. And once you've gone to school on that, then it's useful to come back to Ecclesiastes and, and Song of Solomon because they use that, uh, that kind of training that we have in Proverbs to give us some understanding about it. The word that's translated Ecclesiastes, or the title, it comes from the Greek ecclesiastes, from ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly, the town hall meeting, which is the word that's translated church in the older translations of the New Testament. Uh, and uh, it's a long story how the word church came to be associated with that. Kurikos meaning the Lord's. Things that were associated with the Lord were kurikos. Then it got short and changed into church. It's a completely different kind of angle. But the assembly of God was called the ecclesia. In the Old Testament, the synagogue, or the kahal in Hebrew, which is the whole congregation of Israel. And so this person is called the koheleth, the one who calls together the assembly, or the one who speaks to the assembly. So most of the time, it's translated the preacher. And so if we used what's used in the text as the title, we would call the book the preacher. This is the, the message of the preacher. Um, but again, it's someone who calls together this, this assembly and, and leads the assembly. And it has a female ending on the word that is not completely determinative. It doesn't, not all words with female endings are female words. 
but it, but it gives people an interesting uh, insight because uh, we're going to see in the Song of Solomon seems to be written largely from female point of view uh, that God's Holy Spirit is, a, is able to uh, provide things from a different point of view. But in this particular book, he tells us kind of who he is, that he's a king, he's in Jerusalem, he's wealthy, and so we get the picture he's Solomon. And it is, of course, attributed or, or assigned to Solomon, whether it's as a writer or one who, who published it, who was in charge of the, putting together the, the different team that, that edited it and approved it and sent it out. Nobody knows exactly the process of that. But that book is just an incredibly important book because now that we've done all this training of how to live well, right, and have everything work by doing all the right stuff, what we're reminded of here is something that Proverbs also has in it. Okay, it's just that it's not the main theme of Proverbs. What Coalith comes back to tell us is, you know, when you've done all of that, finally, everything we do on the earth, it, it, it's, just, it's just basically doesn't have any permanent impact except for whether God approves it or not. And that's not just true for, you know, news, weather, and sports. Uh, I, I like to tell preachers when I work with them or, or elders whenever we talk about this in gatherings, that has to do with church work too. Uh, Ephesus was a great engine of evangelism, and today it is a salt marsh. I mean, you could go and see buildings like Teddy showed us, but you know, they look like ruins to me, don't they to you? They're not a going concern. They don't look like uh, one of these buildings that's constantly really functioning in the modern world, because they're not. And you can go to, we saw Colossae. When Teddy showed us a picture of Colossae, what did Colossae look like? Anybody remember? It was an empty hill. It's an empty hill. Okay? And someday, if the world lasts long enough, Folsom may be an empty hill. That's how it is. Everything is vanity. It's, it's emptiness. It's not the word breath that's used for, for the spirit of God, ruach. This is a different word, Hebel. It means just emptiness. And therefore, vapor, breath, meaningless, one guy liked to call it smoke, uh, whatever works for you. But everything is the Lord's gift to each of us. That's the other thing that comes through in Ecclesiastes, and uh, atheistic skeptics don't catch that sometimes. But it's terribly important for us to catch it. Because the church work that, that I and other people like me got so involved with and still get so involved with has a value. It's a gift that God is giving me to be able to be a part of this. And everybody who's ever been involved in teaching and preaching, serving as a deacon and elder, uh, serving as a wife or a woman in, in a congregation who's actively involved in serving other people, you realize that even if the end product doesn't last for thousands of years, there's a great blessing in doing it. It's a gift from God. And the more we see the opportunities that we have as a gift from God, the better we're able to have a good attitude about life. So one thing matters, that's fearing the Lord and keeping his commandments. That comes at the end of the book, as you know. Six simple sections, opening in 1, 1 through 2, that, uh, that life is under the sun is empty. Uh, second section, word picture, the climactic circle, as illustrating the history circle. Uh, many of you may have known D. Bowman's preaching on this sermon. I know that he preached meetings in Vacaville and here and other places. And he, he was a masterful man at, at the chalkboard. And he would start in, and he wouldn't know what he was doing. He'd draw this wavy line that ends up being the West Coast. And then he talks about, the, like he's a weatherman, about the weather coming in off the coast, and then it goes through here, and it goes through there, and the jet stream carries it down here, and it comes back over there. And then he says, and then, a few days later, well, the wind starts out here, and it's the same thing. And anybody who watches the weather for very long, you know that's how it works. And when we have a hot spell, it's because all of that slows down and we don't get that delta breeze as much. And whenever it speeds up, then all of a sudden we have that. And if it backs up completely, we have a north wind. And whatever's in the north, we have either cold or south. It's all very predictable and it doesn't change much unless the jet stream changes its particular path, right? And so he uses this additional illustration then. And in the third section... Uh, he talks about the experiences and lessons that he, that he learned being king in Jerusalem, and this is the body of the sermon. If you think of this as a preacher, then this is the sermon body, right? The main part of the sermon. 
It goes all the way to 11.6. And at the end, then, he contrasts old age with youth wisely lived in the fear of the Lord and notes that life under the sun is vain. But on the other hand, what really matters is fearing God and keeping his commandments. That's the whole of man. That's all there is to being a man. That's the whole duty of man. That's for every man. The, the ambiguous poetic ending of the book reminds us as we work through all the possible meanings of it that that's the big deal, fearing God and keeping his commandments. Uh, now, this is a, a piece that I have not given you yet. We'll talk about it in more detail, but I wanted to kind of flash it to you uh, in general. There's a, there are several better outline, uh, better, short, better complete, more complete outlines. Nobody knows... Solomon didn't leave us. This is the outline. So we have to piece it together by looking at places where different phrases repeat. So it looks like that there's an envelope or it looks like that there's a special pattern coming on. And the different people who study this in detail come up with different ones. This is Michael Eaton's version. I happen to like it, so I'll be using it. Where he opens up knowing the failure under the sun of, of secularism and wisdom and pleasure seeking, but the ultimate certainty or excuse me, ultimate uh, certainty then that happens in, in under the sun, which is death. Then he begins to give us some good news, the grace of living in faith, the providence of God in all things under the sun, the judgment of God, and the contentment. And then he spends some time applying faith's wisdom in different circumstances and questions. He talks about an individualism's self-assurance and notices that that's, that fails. Uh, he talks about it, the fact that when we live for that, we have some problems, oppression without comfort, lonesome rivalry, living without a family, isolation of folly. On the other hand, that circumstance allows us to learn some things, the blessings of companionship as opposed to individualism, and the awe-filled presence of God as opposed to individualism. And so God and his people are then given to us in this book as helpful. The second little section there is on the realities of poverty and wealth. And it's one of the most realistic books about poverty and wealth, as is much of the, pro of the Proverbs. The realities of poverty and wealth, first of all, that poor live under oppressive rule often. That's, that's kind of the way life often is. That there's a certain value and limitation to money and wealth for people who have it. That wealth, love, is always a, a problem because you can, you can love it and it will leave you. But on the other hand, these providences of God are God's gifts and are a grace and a joy. Again, wealth and insecurity, the insatiability of appetites, and then finally the impasse, the central question, that all of these things end in death under the sun. If we get beyond the sun, we talk about the new heavens and the new earth, we talk about the future, the resurrection, that's a different deal. But under the sun, that's where it all ends up, which is why people get depressed when this is how we live. Humans were not designed to live like this. Philosopher Immanuel Kant said you had to project to heaven because no human being could live without the hope of justice. Everybody could see there's not a real justice solve it, solution under the sun. And then there's some ironic truths, some better thans, better than, better than, better than we, we see in Proverbs. And so he noticed that, that there are some better than realities. There are four different dangers that are less better. <laughs> Oppression, haughty-mindedness, anger, and especially jealousy about yesterday. Big warning. If you want to make yourself depressed, talk about how it used to be better than it is. But on the other hand, there's a certain value to wisdom and forbearance. If you have that ability to endure, to forbear, to put up with the disappointments that can come uh, in, in the circumstances of life, things can be good. And then the trial of the, of the quest for wisdom uh, for all of its uh, broken people and yet its value. Uh, it, it still has a value. He leaves us with that over and over again. Uh, D there, the limitations of powerlessness and death. Uh, powerlessness and death are, are connected to one another, but death is only one form of powerlessness. Uh, there is a certain power of authority, and the people who are not the king don't have it. <laughs> and that's frustrating, but he says, you know, kind of get used to that. Because even if you're king, somebody else doesn't have it. That's just how this, this business works. Life's unjust fame under the sun. On the other hand, the central value of fearing the Lord. Life's unjust ends, and yet the value of God's providence. The big enigma, the unknowability of life under the sun. You cannot know what will happen tomorrow, nor 10,000 years from now. It's just not knowable. We can know certain probabilities, 
and then suddenly there's a black swan, something that's outside the probabilities. And then the sting of death for everybody and the value of living and the value of living intensely. That even though we are going to die, it's a good day to give everything you've got for something that God approves that's useful, whatever your age is. Great, great lesson to learn. The limitations uh, of wisdom and the dangers of foolishness, again, he comes back to in this little section here, the ruling uh, role of, of uh, timing and probabilities. Time and chance happens to all. Saving wisdom, forgotten, and valuable wisdom's uh, good is undermined. Uh, as wonderful as wisdom is, uh, a guy can save a city and everybody will forget who he is. Get used to that. that that's normal. Don't expect people to appreciate what you did. That's just normal. And on the other hand, you can do a whole lot of wonderful things and you get one little fly in the ointment, the whole thing stinks. Get used to that. That's the way life under the sun is. And then the heart's central role in being wise or foolish, that finally, no matter what happens, we've got a heart that's got to make a direction in our lives. And then the final little section, the valuable venture of faithful living, the joys of life without grief and anger as a young person, and a wise awareness of the limitations and inevitability that come with aging. All of us who are older certainly can read that with sympathy. And then the epilogue, the entirety of life is fearing God, keeping his commandments, since he will judge our every action. Uh, let me just say that him judging our action is not all bad news. It means that you can do a million things nobody notices but God, and he will never forget any of them. If nobody else notices them, the elders don't notice, the preacher doesn't notice, your husband, your wife, your kids, your parents, no, nobody notices but God. The only one that matters is God. And so there's a great positive message in that. I noticed seven different problems that it talks about, and I had this in the, in the, um, in the show that I shared with you for study. Uh, it's important to recognize the value of submission and respect for the king. The New Testament teaches that. Jesus teaches it. The law taught it. And certainly Ecclesiastes points it out. The apparent inequity of righteous and the wicked. There's, a, there's things that, that happen to righteous that don't happen to, to wicked. The inability to understand the course of God's dealing. And that's going to come out in Job again later. The impossibility of knowing the issues and the duration of life. That wisdom is still valuable, even though it's not always properly rewarded. That wisdom's relative superiority to foolishness. And that we need to live wisely, even if we're living in the misery of a state under a foolish ruler. It may be more important when you live under bad government to behave wisely than it is any other time. Because you may have more downside risk to misbehaving and being fools. Um, this is a little sermon that I preach. Preachers like the sermons they preach. Uh, that tried to summarize Ecclesiastes. I've done it lots of times through the years. But basically it gives a little introduction. And the three main points then is that life is vain. But life is beautiful and joyous. In exactly the same places where it tempts us to covet and despair. And that the difference between despair and joy is recognizing and remembering that our place is in God's universe. I belong to God and he's given me this life. And so then it works through all the different things that he says are empty. Pleasure, human wisdom and knowledge, human praise, success from work, cultural achievement, uh, honorable dreams and intentions, independence, eternal youth, thinking that my life will change the universe. He says all those things are empty and when we do that, and I love how the Holy Spirit puts this, we hate our work and we make our heart to despair. We have pulled the trigger on our despair when we buy into that nonsense. Now get ready for the ride. The exact same things that can be tempting to destroy us are the things that he says are the occasions for joy. Eating, drinking, and working. Beautifying the world, wealth, youth and life, praise from God. Every one of those is a great joy when we see it as a gift from God and it's a great burden that pulls us into depression when we think that's going to make life worthwhile under the sun. Go figure. And so obviously the difference has to do with attitude. Yes? Yes. In the, um, in the 
it's good to see you, Allison. That's a very good question. She's asking about what about using this for evangelism, for studying with people. Uh, in the very first um, uh, le lecture that I did, or you know, direct teaching that I did, I made, I made the point more in passing, but it's in that first essay that I gave out, that article on uh, wisdom from above. I make the point that because everybody has some idea of what they think wise is and right is, this is a natural place to have a bridge to sit down with them and to talk about these things. Now, while that's true for Proverbs, it's also really true for, for Ecclesiastes. It's a little harder with Song of Solomon because that has a very special place. But your point is exactly right. Uh, did you want to elaborate on that in terms of have you used it that way or do you have some insights into that? Not only that, it breaks up easily into smaller parts that you can spend a week on this section, a week on the next section, a week on the next section. So once you have an understanding of the different parts of it and how it, how it divides itself, then you can take one section and study that one, then the next one and study that one. And if you don't like the ones that I've got, you can subdivide it in other ways. But I, I would suggest you, you let it end in a place where it naturally ends because it, it is making the point it's going to get to whenever you uh, accept the Holy Spirit's organization. It's a great question. It's an important question. Because these are natural inroads for evangelism. Everybody I know who preaches and teaches in people's homes will, will have some approach where we come out of, out of Ecclesiastes or out of Proverbs or out of both of them or either of them. Uh, it's a terribly good way to do that. Okay? Everybody see what that point which he's making? Yeah, Terry. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> That's right. It tells you why you should need Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Exactly right. And then you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. In real life, here you are in this class, a sophomore class. The teacher assigns it, which is interesting, because sometimes teachers have read it from a point of view of a skeptical person who just sees the downside and doesn't see that there actually is a God, so this is going to a good place. But when you read the same book and you know where the ending is, then it's a wonderful book. And, and that's exactly right. Is that pretty much the point you wanted to emphasize? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very true. So anyway, if we have an attitude of recognizing that God is over all of creation, including me, that I'm just a creature, I'm a human creature, so I have special obligations and special capacities like you do, but we're still creatures. We're not on a negotiating level with God. And so, finally, he's wanting us to be a part of his project. Well, we saw in Colossians and Ephesians of reconciling all of creation back to himself, aligning all of creation once again to himself. It'll be finished in the resurrection in Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, and so forth, right? That's, that's what we're about. Secondly, that God's plans are beyond my understanding. If God's revealed us something in Scripture, we can take it to the bank figuratively. But the rest of it is just, your guess is as good as mine. And that means it's not any good at all. Finally, God's the only one who really knows where we're going. Thirdly, I enjoy all things when I remember that God is their source, and they're his gifts to me in creation. And so these things that he gives me, once I realize they're God's gift, and I use them in a way that's appropriate for my situation, everything's good. And then I'm thankful when I remember both the prosperity and adversity are gifts from God. Both prosperity and adversity are gifts from God. We don't like to hear that. So we got five minutes. I'm going to do Song of Solomon. Is that right? Five minutes, right? Okay, good. So let me blow through some of this. 
now it's, my phone is reminding me that it's time. I actually remember my phone this time, so that was good. Uh, three possible reasons for the Song of Solomon to remind us that the Lord owns creation, reproduction, mating, and courtship, so his authorized love language builds up while expressing healthy sexual passion. And again, I provided this for you uh, in the show that I gave you. I think that this is terribly important. I think that when you have the dysfunctions that come when people don't understand this, in Christian homes that are Christian homes, supposedly, but people don't get this, it's really dangerous. Because people then are left to pagan ideas about how courtship and romance and sexuality are supposed to happen. And believe me, pagan ideas have been bad ever since paganism was. They have always created a bad, bad circumstance that eventuates then in sexual immorality of various kinds, including homosexuality. If you don't accept God's gift and learn how to exercise it the way God has taught us to and illustrated by these lovers, then you're going to have a problem. And I'll talk much more about that when we get to that. But it shows the similarities of the Lord's passion for his people and of Christ's love for his people as well. But mostly I want to comp on that first. There are four different ways of looking at it. There's a drama, a song, a poem, or, or a, a pastoral poem. Uh, all of them are ways of expressing either events or developments or a story or moments. And all of those things happen in sexual, romantic marriage relationships. Uh, and so they're all interesting ways of looking at it. The Holy Spirit didn't tell us what it was. And as you all know by now, my... my my understanding is that the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us it must not be important. It can be very important to me. I may be very curious about it. But you can get what God wants you to have out of this without having a firm idea of most of this stuff. I think it's more of an anthology or a set of, of, of different poems. It's not an allegory, that's for sure. Or allegory didn't even exist until the 4th century BC. This is uh, 10th century. Um, it has some types that can be used. It, it has some parabolic usages, uh, but again, uh, the important thing is the thing itself. And here's the thing itself. You have five different songs that's part of one song. It's called the Song of Songs, the greatest song, okay? And it's associated with Solomon, although we do not know that Solomon is any of the characters in it per se. And that's kind of important to recognize. Especially in an environment back then when if you were... If you were uh, if you were in a marriage relationship with someone, you would call your husband sometimes your king and sometimes call your wife your queen. Anybody here who's married ever call their spouse king or queen? It happens, doesn't it? It does whenever you're really trying to court, isn't it? I mean, this is a, so this is a courtship series of songs, is what it is. Um, the way poetry works in the ancient world, the center is always the most important part. We'll see that in Job, too. Job 28 is the center Job 28 is the important part of Job. The important part is 3, 6 through 5, 1, which is the consummation section, the wedding, whether it's one event or two. Um, we'll talk about when we get to that. And so here's how it works. This is something that I stole from, uh, from Dr. Carr. and He's written lots of books about this for many, many years. I happen to think that it fits. When you see that as the center, the first and the fifth uh, songs are anticipation of love and affirmation of it. Another form of anticipation after you've enjoyed it. The, affirm the, the anticipation before you've enjoyed marriage and then the continued anticipation after you've been... I've been married for 51 years. I still anticipate being with my wife. If you don't, I feel really sorry for you, okay? Or your husband, as the case may be. But it can happen, okay? By God's grace, it can happen. The two middle sections are problematic. I know, I know guys that you can go to on the internet who won't even do the number four, okay? Both of them have situations where somebody finds, loses, and finds the person right before the consummation. And then even after the consummation, there's a loss of communion and then a refining of it. Don't think when you get married, you're never going to ever lose the person for a moment or two or longer and that if you lose them, you can never find them again. Big mistake. And the Holy Spirit gives us a beautiful song that reminds us that this can resolve. And so then the final affirmation happens after that. The way that poetry works, the first section is the anticipation. The second is the found, lost, found. The consummation is the middle. Then lost, found, affirmation. 
that forms an X, which is chi in Greek, and that's called a chiasm. That's the form of the book. It's five songs, they all fit together, and the center is the main point. And the center then has to do with the great relationship we have by God's design to sexually desire one another, to have that satisfied in marriage, and continually satisfied in marriage, just on the relationship level. Nothing is said here about children. It's all interesting in that regard. There are four different times he says, don't stir love until it pleases or it's ready. And it's in each of these four sections that are not the consummation. 2, 7, 3, 5, 5, 8, 9, 8, 4. The middle section, he doesn't say that because it's ready. It's, it's, it's editorial comment. Okay? This is another uh, version of it that we'll talk about when we get there. But I think that's the key things I wanted to get through tonight. Any observations in, in closing? Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to having some wonderful facilitation time on Sunday. Thanks for your time and attention.
Good evening. It is uh, time for us to begin, and we're going to have a uh, worship service with uh, song and prayer this evening. <clears throat> but uh, before we begin, I just have a few announcements. Uh, the, the first of which is the YPM is going to be this Sunday at 6 p.m., um, and that's for the 6th through 8th graders. And if you have any questions, see Rhonda Agee about uh, if you need to bring, if there's anything you can bring, or anything else for that matter. Um, and then the second announcement is we need some help moving some chairs from rooms, classrooms 15 and 16, uh, in the back there to the outside, uh, down the, the back hall. And so see John Daniels, if, you're, if you can do that after services, see John Daniels uh, by those classrooms um, to help take out those chairs. And that's all I have this evening, so I will hand it over to our song leader. Evening. We'll be singing number 224 from the large book. 224. There's a rainbow in the cloud. Know me as I journey here mid the toil and tear. There's a rainbow in the cloud. He will safely lead. I must have no fear. There's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow shining. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When life's race is run and the victory's won, there's a rainbow in the cloud. After storm and rain, fields of golden grain, there's a rainbow he will send and paint summer's harvest grain. There's a rainbow in the cloud. There's a rainbow in that is shining. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When life's race is run. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When the storms all pass, comes a brighter day. There's a rainbow in the cloud. In the city fair, there's a crown to wear. There's a rainbow. In the cloud, there's a rainbow that is shining. There's a rainbow in the cloud. When life's race is run and the victory's won, there's a rainbow in the cloud. honor of teaching the junior high class tonight, um, and I'll tell you about what we talked about, but um, um, originally when I, when I thought about what I'd say, I thought it would be appropriate to say, and then it was night. Um, last night I got a text from somebody who loves me saying that the young child of our dear friend that was gravely injured. And I, I don't know what would happen. You would think, right? ER doc, cool as a cucumber. It hurts. And it should hurt. I, I desperately wish I could tell you what would happen. But I just don't know. 
and, and it's hard. Luke 12, verses 13 through 21 reads, Someone on the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist of abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land, the land of a rich man produced plentiful, plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is the one that lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. So as it is, the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The first time I was up here this summer, I mentioned that I had some things to say about time. I don't think I can do it justice in this short little bit. But I will say, I think it's probably the most precious commodity that we have. I don't know if it's a commodity. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Everyone knows it, what time is, but if you ask them for a definition, that's a little harder. One moment leads to the next, and before you know it, you're a whole lot older than you ever thought, it, than you ever thought was possible. Trust me. You guys, will, you guys will see. In Scripture, when it comes to matters of faith, there's a distinct emphasis that you're only guaranteed this moment. So here's what we discussed, or a summary of what we discussed in the junior high class. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his, this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of of the blood of bulls and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? That perfect sacrifice, if we accept it and we are baptized, unifies us with him and his death. And the uncertainty of this world, as painful as it is, won't change. But there is certainty in our faith and where we will be if we hold fast to our faith. Um, if anybody has any need tonight, please come forward as we stand and sing. Living below in this old sinful world, comfort I get from God's own word, striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Nay, are kind, I love them every one. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, 
Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand, with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? We'll now be led in a closing prayer. Before we close the prayer, just one last announcement. Um, if we could, the junior high and high school, if you're signed up to help out with BBS, go to the back classroom right after uh, we pray tonight. Okay? Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come here tonight. and We thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Lord, tonight we lift up little Sophia and her family. We pray that you're with the doctors that are taking care of her. If it's your will, heal her quickly. Be with the family and support them, Lord. Let them lean on you. Be with Ben and Len and the, their families as they support these families. And let us help as we can. Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings you give us. You lift us up each day. You guide us. You gave us your son. Lord, we pray that we can be good examples and continue to be lights in everything we do this week. Keep us all healthy and safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, a reminder, if you can help move some chairs, fellas, bring the muscles in the back real quick. Thanks.